Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm very glad that all of you are here. Those of you that are with us online, those of you that are here with us in the room, I'm glad you're with us today. Ones in the room, I've already told them, those of you on the other side of that piece of glass, <laughs> we're going to have church this morning. I'm looking forward to this word, and I'm nervous about it at the same time. <laughs> it's one of those. Matthew chapter 7. Verses 21 through 23 is where we're going to begin, and as we always do, there'll be more scripture than just that today, but I believe the Lord has a word for us out of Matthew chapter 7 this morning. If you follow us online, you probably see the announcement that I posted last night about the title of this morning's sermon, Christians Without Christ. Christians Without Christ. How can there be such a thing? Let's talk for a minute. Let's find out this morning. Hope you've had a chance to find Matthew 7. We're going to read verses 21 through 23 together. I'll pray, and then we're just going to go till we're done. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? And I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for every single word and letter of it. I thank you that you've made it plain and clear to us. I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather and hear from it this morning. And I am grateful, Lord, that you take the time to humble yourself and invest something in us again and again and again. I pray that it will be no different this morning, that your spirit will empower me to speak well and that it will be present in this room and that he will be present in the hearts of your people and that the work that you have intended for this day and this time will be accomplished in the hearts of your people. Let us receive what you would have for us. Make clear the way for the coming of the word of the Lord this morning. We thank you. We're grateful in advance for what you would say to us, and we look forward to the opportunity to receive it and put it into practice in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to read this, this couple of verses one more time. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who does, only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name, and then I will announce to them, Depart from me, I never knew you, you evildoers. It is far too easy, or I should say it has become, or we have made it far too easy in the modern church to carry the appearance of Christianity without carrying with it the sacrifice of Christ. We have done the world... And we have done ourselves a great disservice by maximizing the message of what Christ will return to you if you will just pray a prayer and come into his church. And minimizing the investment that is required to be considered a disciple in relationship with a living God. Perhaps one of the greatest tragedies of the modern church is that we have failed to make a distinction between ourselves and the world in which we live. Not just by separating ourselves and looking different and dressing different and having a different schedule. I'm not talking about superficial differences. We've simply made it acceptable to look as much like the world and still say we're saved as we possibly can. We've not made a distinction between who we are and who he wants us to be. As a whole, we suffer in a culture of faith. <sighs> Lord, help me. Where we are not modeling a difference in our lifestyle that's based on who and what we say we believe. We're chasing the appearance of something without the substance that is necessary to sustain it. As Christians and disciples, as people that I'm talking to this morning, that I believe with all my heart the Lord must have gathered you for a reason to hear this. 
I believe he must have pulled me into my office for a reason to hear this. Let us not be the kind of people who have downplayed the differences between ourselves and the world and minimized the cost of Christ. Within the faith of the church in the day in which we live, and I'm not just saying this to be hard on people, I'm being hard on myself. I'm not even being hard on anybody. The Lord's being hard on me. We've created the sense that it is easy to become saved by downplaying what it costs you to do so. And we've lived as if it were free and easy for us to receive what the Lord's given us. The breakdown is twofold. For one, I've mentioned already, we, we fail to distinguish ourselves as different from the world. Now, Pastor, we do distinguish ourselves as different. We only wear certain clothes. We have a dress code. We only speak in a certain way. We don't say certain words. We don't drink, smoke, chew, or go with girls that do. We have a code of conduct that we carry ourselves by. We are different, but are we? The truth of the matter is, the Lord designed us as His children to lead the Lord designed us as His creation to be out front, setting a standard, not chasing one that was established by someone else outside of the kingdom of God. The sad reality is much of our Christian culture and much of the way that we function as Christians today is chasing the standard of the world and trying to impose upon it the kingdom of God. Our music and our art and our movies and our education, we have patterned our systems on what the world finds appealing and we've simply just tried to drape the blanket of Christianity across the top of it as if we can sanctify something that was never holy. We are not designed to chase after the world. We're not designed to reclaim or repaint or redesign a worldly standard. We are called to set one which is completely separate and different in every way. Not just in a superficial way that makes us look like, oh, they're the weirdos that follow Jesus. But to set one in the sense that we are obviously motivated by and driven by and, and connected to something completely different than their interests. If we look at the very beginning of time and the way that God began, Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created. He made. He set standards and boundaries. And we look at the rest of those passages in Genesis and we say, He divided the light from the dark. He divided the earth from the water. He formed what He wanted from the ground and from the air. In Genesis 1 27, then it says, God created man in His own image. Being a God who was creative and established boundaries and set things in order, he then created man in an image with the intention that man would then create boundaries and form things and set things in order after the same fashion as the one who made him. In Genesis 2.19, when God forms man out of the dust of the ground, it says, Then he gave to him every wild animal and every bird in the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called that living creature, that was its name. God established a standard. God entrusted the standard to those he created. And then God set man in authority over everything else in the world. We who are following Christ should be setting a standard rather than trying to sanctify someone else's process. There must be a distinction between us. The light and the dark must be separated. The earth and the land, they must be separated and divided. The air above the waters and the heavens above that, there must be a distinction between them if we're to follow Christ the way that we say we do. For the better part of history, mankind has done an excellent job in bearing that banner. If you go all the way back into the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, David summoned the best musicians in the land to play the songs that he had written for the Lord. He brought the best the land had to present what he had to the Lord. David did not say, what are the best musicians doing right now? I want to write some songs like them. 
He did not say, what are the most beautiful artists creating right now? We need to do something in that style. He did not say, what is the rest of the world doing with their worship? How can I make the way we worship our God appealing to them? David said, you're the best at it. Now come do it for my God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 2, Solomon builds the temple for the Lord and he summons 153,000 of the best artisans in the world and says, you've done good work here. You've done good work here. Now come do it for the kingdom of God. A standard was set that this is how God does things. You move forward a few thousand years. In the 1400s, formalized state-sponsored education became a thing. We started having this idea that everyone should learn something and there should be an educational system. You want to know where that began? It began in the church because the church realized how important it was that everyone be able to read the Bible for themselves. The church started it. Later in that same century in the 1400s, it was the church that funded the Renaissance period of art that is still considered in all of history to be one of the greatest outpourings of creative work upon the earth since creation itself. And it was the money of the church that said, I want you who are the best sculptors and painters to come and depict the greatness of my God. The church carried this banner And we did it well because it's what we were designed to do, not to look at what the world was doing, but to make the best and set the standard for everyone else to follow. But then we reach the modern day. At some point in the 1900s, the Western world lost the way in leading the culture of the world. And by the latter part of the century, Christians were scrambling to try and regain our influence or even our presence or people being aware that, hey, we make songs too. We teach. We're smart. We have an idea about how things should go. How heartbreaking that we were trying to regain And in fact, we still live in a culture now that by and large, people look at it and say the Christian version is just inferior. It's the wish.com version of whatever. But the Christians have something that's cool, so that's nice. Good for them. It's a little subcategory. It's a blip on the map. How did we go from being the one that God created and entrusted to set the standard to being the people who were chasing the establishment of the world? We live in a world... Now, I guess there are some areas, if we're being honest, where where we would say it seems that we've caught up. But what a horrible statement. What a heartbreaking thing to say that God's people have caught up with the world that they were given to set a standard in and to control and to name and to lead as a reflection of their God. That's one of the worst things that could have possibly happened to the faith because we became less distinct at our best Right now, when we look at the world, we have become homogenized. That's just a big word that means just like everything else. John 15, 19. Jesus says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of it, the world hates you. We are not called to look and act and behave like the world and just be one streak of color in the smear of all the other colors of what's happening on the planet. God created, God formed, God set man in order. And at some point the church dropped the reins. And now at our best we are indistinct from the world around us. That's not what Christianity looks like. That's a faith that has relied on culture and superficial differences and has become a culture of Christianity that lacks Christ. We're not called to look or act or behave like the world. Catching up is a tragic description of what the world looks like or what the world looks upon us and thinks that we're doing. But it's obvious to them that that's what we're doing. Your church looks just like a concert. Your passion and your emotion are indistinguishable from great acting. And you've given us a picture that we could be like you with no sacrifice. What's the incentive? What's different about you? You're trying so hard to be us. Why would we want to be you? 
We've created a Christianity without Christ that says you can look and talk and act and sound like everyone else, and it costs you nothing, but you can still say you're saved. We're not talking about appearances. We're not talking about jeans and tattoos and T-shirts on the platform and modern instruments. What we're talking about is trying to persuade people to follow a culture that shows no significant difference. They see it as a fraud, and they hate us for it. It's one thing if the world rejects us because we are taking a stand for Christ, but it's a completely different one when they see you're fake, you're lagging behind, you're trying too hard. What a joke. Jesus is praying again in John 17, verses 14 through 18. He says, I've given them your word. The world hated them because they're not of the world as I'm not of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of this world as I'm not of this world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. I can't stress this enough. We're not talking about an appearance that is just my lifestyle, that is my culture, that is the way I dress, that is the way I decorate my skin, that is what music I'm listening to. There's something more to this that's missing. This is a matter of a missing component that would actually influence our behavior It would influence the way in which we participate in the world. It would cause a reaction from the world for the right reasons. What we're missing is the indwelling of Christ himself in the people that call themselves Christians today. Too many people wear the title of Christian but lack the spirit of Christ. We're not called to separate ourselves from the world to the point of irrelevance. When I'm talking about distinction, I don't mean superficial differences. But we're called to go into the world, and we're called to participate in it in a way that people recognize. They should be able to see that something about us is different. But we are powerless to do what God has asked us to do. And the state of the church and the state of the world and the state of everything that Christians say that we're part of and the reactions of the world to it, all of that is the result of us trying to do it powerless. We're powerless to do what we've been asked to do if we've not ourselves been changed by that power, and we've not ourselves been in the presence of that holy God, and we've not accepted his purpose. If that's not been birthed of us and we've not been changed and renewed by him, it is no wonder that we are indistinct from the world. We're just good people. And we've given our club a name. Praying a prayer and changing your clothes and stopping your bad habits do not accomplish the work of God. This passage that we began with this morning, Lord, Lord, didn't we? That phrase we must realize, is not directed at sinners who never heard the word of God. It's not directed at people who are seeking God and just happen to show up to the party a minute or two too late after the door was closed. Lord, Lord, that phrase is directed at a people who claim to be Christians but haven't been changed by Christ. It's directed at a church that has become a culture It's directed at a group of people who have not yet become, as we saw in John 17, 17, sanctified by the truth. Sanctified means set apart. It doesn't mean better than you. It doesn't mean different because I know more and I've been around longer and I smell better. That's not sanctification. There were plenty of priests in the the temple that were not sanctified. And they were around incense and dressed in a certain way and bathed in a certain way. Probably the best looking, most impressive people in all of the world in their day sanctified by the truth it means set apart it means there's a distinction because there's something in me that is obviously different because I live from a motivation of what is actually true not what I'm looking at that other people would say seems real and that motivation dictates my words and my actions and is what drives me it's not just behavior it's a change that has happened inside of my body and inside of my soul that is indescribable but absolutely noticeable When there's no distinction between ourselves and other people, we're not giving the people that we say we want to save any incentive to follow our God. There's nothing different about you. Why would I want to do what you're doing? It looks like an imported version of what I'm doing anyway with a whole lot more rules that are a whole lot less fun. 
when there's no distinct difference or direction or motive, why would you change course? Lord, Lord is directed at people who have said I'm a Christian, but whose lives have no distinction from the people around them. Six times in the book of Acts, the disciples of Christ are called people of the way. People of the way. Why? Because it was obvious they were headed in a different direction than everything around them. Jesus himself told them in John 14, 6, in, in the midst of some of those seven statements he makes about who he is, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He is a way. He is the way that sets us apart. The truth that we receive by committing ourselves to that way is what gives us direction. And his life inside of us is what gives us the power to do what he's asked us to do. Apart from that, we fall short. His way doesn't look like anything else. I have to ask you this morning at this point in this message, how different does your life look from the people that you say you're living in the world with and hoping to influence? I don't mean you have to dress like a weirdo. I don't mean you have to talk like a strange person that they would reject. By all means, you have a tribe of people that the world will recognize you as one of them, and then when they get around you, they will be obvious to them. Something is different. But if that's not happening and you just slot in and fit in and you're just one of, where's the distinction? <sighs> is the distinction that's in you because you're following Christ, is it visible enough that the people around you notice and say something about it? Or are you just a nicer, friendlier, more generous, better smelling version of the same group of people that you're standing in right now? Is Christ obvious in, you li in your life or are you just a Christian by culture because you said a prayer and you watched a sermon this morning? And that leads us to the second issue. I told you we have two problems, Christians without Christ. Number one is there's a lack of distinction. And number two is we minimize the cost of following Christ. We have made it too small. There's a broad and easily accessible religious road that says just pray a prayer, make this one-time decision for Christ, and you're in our club for the rest of eternity. Just to be clear, I'm not just making fun of the Baptists or the Methodists or the non-denominational guys or the mega churches. I'm talking about the church. Come pray a prayer, now you're saved. Come to church on Sunday, now you're saved. We minimize the cost. There is a wide, broad, accommodating path in what we call Christianity today that says there's plenty of grace for your laziness. There's plenty of grace for your self-indulgence. There's plenty of grace for your single-serving sins every so often. Don't worry about any of that. Are we supposed to be perfect? No, but we should strive perfectly for it. And it will cost us something. And Jesus was pretty straightforward and pretty honest about that. And we've dropped the ball in letting people know that it's not all kittens and bubbles when we come to Christ. Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and how difficult is the road that leads to true life? Few find it. We're not just talking this morning about the big banner sins over the lives of those who are completely lost and are not even trying to find Christ right now. We're not just talking about wicked sinners and the broad road of the world that leads to destruction. This is a wake-up call for Christians who don't have the power of Christ in their life. This is a wake-up call for people who say that I'm a believer, but my faith costed me nothing more than my bended knee those years ago, and I'm late for dinner on Sunday pretty much every week because that darn preacher is so long-winded. Jesus didn't call us to make a simple statement. 
out of our mouths with words about what we believe and then go on our merry way. Come to the river. Do you believe I'm here? Wonderful, you may go now. That was not the call of Christ. Jesus stated clearly and repeatedly that following him required a radical change and a dramatic, profound sacrifice on the part of the people that would come. He didn't preach a message of peace and love and harmony if you will just believe by saying, oh, this must be true, I like this. Jesus called for something radical to happen in the lives of people, and it came at great cost to them. Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me, he will find it. If anyone wants to come with me, he must deny himself. When's the last time you told yourself no? As a Christian, when's the last time you looked at something you wanted and said That doesn't honor God. I can't. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. It's an instrument of torture, of pain, of difficulty. And take it up does not just mean pick it up for a minute and drag it to the next room and then sit it down while you do what you wanted to do anyway. Pick it up, set it in the ground, and hang yourself on it so that your flesh is not able to strain against it and get over here and mess something up. Deny yourself and take part in that and then follow Christ. Jesus did not mince words, but we've made them small and simple and warm and fuzzy. I'm not calling for us to be harder and more difficult. I'm accepting the fact that this morning that probably 90% of the people that are listening are Christians. 90% of us or more probably already believe we've done that until we're confronted with the reality of the way we're living. I don't mean that we should make the gospel unpleasant and difficult You've heard me preach too many times about making sure that we are in the world and that we are leading people to Christ by being an example of him that brings him glory and gives him a good reputation. And walking out into the world and just being mean and cruel and hard is not the way to do it, but being direct and honest is absolutely a necessity. And we've got to start by doing it with ourselves. Have I actually done what this requires? Or have I said a prayer and they punched my card and now I'm in the club? Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. That means if I look at the world around me and I think I would like to have a lot of these things. And I'm willing to acquire those before I'm willing to say, where is God in this? I'm not dead. The life that I have found is one that is temporary. The blessings that I found when I say I'm going to go to church and because I give, I'm going to be blessed. And because I tithe, I'm going to be blessed. And because I spend time around other people and I have all these connections and relationships within the church that are going to get me ahead in the world, I'm going to call that the blessing of God. But if there's no change that's happened inside of me, then I have found my life in the world around me in my Christian club. But I have lost what truly matters. Whoever wants to save his life, whoever wants to build himself a comfortable life, whoever wants to sign God's name to the check on their mansion here, that's hard. You want to save your life, you'll lose what matters. But if you lose your life, you'll find it in him. And Jesus wasn't kidding. Because no pun intended to drive the point home, he picked up a literal cross, denying himself and put himself on it and died so that he could lead the way and say, this is what it looks like, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your faith. Losing your life is no small act. Jesus' example of what that would cost was no small demonstration. It was a radical and extreme application of belief. Every disciple that followed Jesus ended up a martyr except one. And that one ended up tortured and exiled on an island. I dare say the bodies of those men were not comfortable.
And they knew full well what they were signing up for. Jesus told them at the outset, this is what will happen. Your soul will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. There will be peace and joy that comes from the Spirit of God that will take place inside of you. But he was honest about what that meant in the world, and it was not slotting comfortably in with my newfound spiritual upgrades. Matthew 10, 16 through 18, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Wolves hunt sheep. They hunt them. I have a friend of mine who recently purchased a farm, and he's got some chickens on it. And I was on the phone with him the other day talking for about 45 minutes about a project we're working on together. And while I'm on the phone with him, he says, Whoop, Fox got one of the chickens. That one's gone. Wild animals hunt domestic animals for prey, for sport, to devour them, to do with them as they see fit. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as serpents and harmless as doves, because people will hand you over to the Sanhedrins. Oh, people will hand you over to the officials of the church. Put a pin in that. And they will flog you in their synagogues. Hang on to that. Beware of them. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness to them and to the nations. We like the last verse. I send you out like sheep among wolves. That's all right. I'll be okay. The Lord's going to empower me and I will stand in front of important people and I will tell important things. And then we look at that one preacher out of the hundreds of thousands that are in America and when we see him get to go pray for the president, we think, see, that's one guy. One opportunity for one moment. But we all want to identify with that great banner. I will stand before governors and kings. I will be given the opportunity to be in front of very important people and tell them very important things about my very important God because I am so very important. It's not what Jesus said. We leave that middle section out. Wolves hunt sheep. And being hunted is not a life of peace and comfort. I was talking to somebody about that before service this morning. If the time comes that they begin hunting down Christians, how long will most of us survive in the woods? It'd probably be better for us to just stay where we are and wait for them to come for us and get out of this quickly rather than live scared and die anyway. Better to have the Spirit of God inside of us and be willing to say, this is what I believe, this is what I know, and to live as Christ and to die as gain, and I'll just die today rather than running scared and doing nothing for the sake of the kingdom for the next three months trying to save my family in the woods. That's dramatic. That's radical. We sell people a lie. We sell them a lie when we tell them to say a prayer. And all will be well with them. Jesus did not preach such a gospel. That phrase I told you to hang on to, they will flog you in their synagogues. Hear me this morning. Jesus said thousands of years ago, there will be a group of people that call themselves the church that will look on those that actually have my spirit inside of them and they will mock them and they will make fun of them and they will sacrifice them and they will drag them into their churches to make an example of them and say, this is what we do to people who believe differently than us because that's not what faith looks like. We're not far from that right now. We're doing it right now on social media and in denominations and in different churches. Oh, look, we believe this and we've embraced that and we've decided to move along and those people are dinosaurs and fossils. They're just, they're never going to make it because they're hanging on to those old ideas of faith. Do you see we're on the, on the front edge of this? The knife is beginning to cut. They will flog you in their synagogues. The people who call themselves believers will make fun of you as they set up teachers of their own design to teach themselves the doctrine that they have decided is true. For your soul, if you follow Christ, yes, there will be peace. But for your flesh and your mind, there may never be such a thing. Come follow Jesus. It's a big party. What a horrible disservice. We live a life where there's no distinction between us and the world, and then we fail to tell people what the true cost actually is. We should be leery of a gospel that seeks to soothe our senses. 
We should be leery of a gospel that plays on our emotions and offers us blessings that we can actually touch and see. That passage that you hear me quote all the time from the, message, the, the ministry of Jesus, Mark 1.15, when he says, repent and believe, it's not just a simple cliche that Jesus was giving his people. It's look at those two words the way Jesus meant them. I love that passage because it does simplify things. It takes away all of the garbage that the world adds and say, you have to do this and you have to do that. All the stuff that the church adds and say, says, well, you also have, you got to be baptized and you got to dress right and we got to fix all your problems. Jesus cut it right down to what it is, but that doesn't mean that it's all happy and easy. Look at the two words. Repent and believe. Let's start with belief. Belief in Jesus is not just an intellectual or an emotional consent to an idea. I'm the son of God. Oh, great, that's awesome. You want to go get a steak? Oh, hey, how about you get us some fish? I heard you've done that a time or two. Love some fish. It's not an intellectual or emotional idea. It's not a consent to something. Belief means I've given myself wholesale to something. And I've done it at the expense of everything that I know and everything that I've ever done. It costs me everything. If he is who he says he is and he's asking me to do what he says do, if I believe it, my life's going to reflect it and that's going to mean nothing I've ever done matters anymore and nothing that I want matters anymore. I'm motivated by something else because there's a spirit living in me that's different than the one that I had before and different than the one that the world has in it. You look at the example of the disciples, they left their families, they left their careers we sit around, especially in, in spirit-filled churches and Pentecostal churches and churches that say we're full of the Spirit of God and we want to chase all this power and all of this fire and all of these great demonstrations of God and we, we idolize and romanticize the first century church. We look at the book of Acts and say, I want that. When will that come again? How long would you last if you were being hunted for your life and having to speak in code because the government was trying to kill you? pray for the first century church. I pray that it doesn't become that way, but I read a book that tells me it will, and we're not prepared for it because we're not sold out to this idea because we don't really believe. The disciples left their families and their careers. The early church was a people that feared daily for their lives, literally had to speak in code right in the sand while they talked about something else and hoped the other person understood what they were saying. They had to live in communities and depended on each other in their skill sets because they could not depend on the world to provide anything for them once they knew who they were. They knew what they were getting into when they signed up for this and they did it anyway because they said this is worth it. I've quoted this verse already once this morning, but I'll give you the reference now. Philippians 1.21 for me, living is Christ and dying is gain. The words of Paul, and he wrote, wrote those words not from a place of blessing and safety, and he wrote them not as a figure of speech. He wrote them at a time when his life was truly at stake. And still he said, if I die, totally worth it. Following Christ is not just a dramatic play or some change in your behavior. It is profound and it is revolutionary. That's belief. Let's look at repentance for a minute. A minute. Repentance is not just an apology. Repentance is not, I'm sorry, Jesus, that I hurt your feelings. I'm going to try not to do that again. Repentance is a transformation that is humanly impossible. Repentance is walking away. It's that denying yourself and taking up your cross. If I said we were going to have a crucifixion right here on stage this morning in front of this camera, who would sign up to be the example? No one? Why? It's obvious why. I like my life. I'm precious about my life. I don't want to carelessly lose it, but I can't prize it so much that losing it is more valuable to me than what I gain by truly repenting and giving my whole heart over to the Lord. And we say we would love to die for him, but we won't set the alarm an hour earlier and pray. We say we would die for him, but we can't be bothered to pray right now for a friend. I'm going to be honest with you. If you ask me to pray for you about something, I'm either going to pray for you right that minute 
or it might be as soon as I hang up the phone or I will write it down somewhere and it'll be as soon as I get home because I'm in a place where for some reason I can't. But if I say, I mean, I, I used to say, and I try not to say anymore out of habit, oh, we'll pray for you, brother, and then walk away because too often we don't do it because it's too hard to do. It's too hard to remember. I've got other things that are more important to do. You can't be bothered to pray right now for someone who says, I have a need. And yet you say, I'll die for the Lord. Repentance is a purposeful, radical, humanly impossible transformation that takes place in us. And repentance is the first word in Jesus' ministry. The very first thing he says in his public ministry is repent and believe. A friend of mine pointed out for me recently that, that that's actually the same message that John the Baptist was giving to prepare the way for the Lord. Repent and believe and prepare the way for the coming of the Son of God. And here's something that you may or may not have considered. Both Jesus and John the Baptist were preaching to the Jews. Okay, so what? The Jews were a group of people who believed they were following the law and serving the Lord and doing everything just right and didn't think they needed to do anything different because they had it all figured out. And both John the Baptist and Jesus came to those people and said, you need a radical transformation in your life because what you're doing won't cut it. Repent is a command to stop depending upon yourself. Stop trusting yourself that what I'm doing surely is pleasing God. Don't depend upon yourself and don't depend upon the great thing God did yesterday or the thing you did yesterday that was the right thing. Stop depending upon yourself to bring you into the presence of God. You need His Spirit to do it, and it's got to be dwelling in you if you're going to get there. Repent is a command to evaluate everything about the way you are living and to compare it to the standard of Christ and then to walk away from everything that doesn't meet His standard. That's repentance. Do you get the picture? It's humanly impossible. We can't be Christians without Christ. We can't repent and believe without the dwelling of His Spirit inside of us and ours being ripped out of us violently if necessary. No human being is capable of this in their own strength. And if we were, the list of rules in the Old Testament would have been sufficient. But the 613 laws of the Torah were not enough to make people holy in the sight of God. John the Baptist and Jesus looked at those people and said, Repent, though you've kept every law perfectly. The ten rules... Of the Ten Commandments, we're not sufficient. That's why we expanded those to the 613. The one commandment of Genesis. We couldn't follow that, and that's why it became 10 and became over 600. And still, it was not good enough. No human can do it. If we were capable of doing it, the sacrifice of Jesus would have been for nothing. Galatians 2, 19 and 21, Paul mentions this. He says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could come through the law, then Christ died for nothing. There's a cost that we are guilty of minimizing when we say, I repent and I believe. There's a cost that we are guilty of minimizing when we take these massive undertakings that we can't accomplish on our own and we present them to people as pray a prayer, come to service with me. Don't listen to that band. Stop wearing those clothes. God, convict us and break our hearts for this. Father, don't let us any longer be Christians without Christ. When we pray this prayer, this is not just a simple prayer that we would say, I'm sorry, Lord, and I want to think differently from now on. Repent and believe is a constant process of self-denial that separates us from the lifestyle of the sinner and separates us from a simple culture, even within the church. We can't be casual Christians because there is no such thing. This is what it means to be a Christian. 
Yes, there is great eternal reward and there is peace that you will not experience anywhere else. It passes all understanding. It is a peace that does not make sense in the circumstances you will find yourself in if you are truly radical enough to say, I believe. There is great eternal reward, but it's accompanied by a great personal earthly sacrifice. The people that follow Jesus are radicals. I keep using that word, and I'm from the, I grew up in the 90s, and so that word somewhat minimized, you know, for me. Radical, dude. Things are extreme these days, man. Even the Doritos. Extreme. You got to get the regular Doritos. I got the extreme ones. Don't want to dilute the word. But there's not another one that means the same thing on the level of what's required here. This is a radical, extreme change that we're not capable of. The people that follow Jesus are recognizable and distinct from the world, not because of superficial differences in the way they live their life, not because they've just separated themselves for separation's sake, but because the transformation inside of them is evident in everything outside of them. The way that we use our body, the way that we speak, the way we apply our mind, the values by which we judge what we do, it's different when what's inside of us is changed because when Christ lives in me, I can't see the same way anymore. And I can't be who I was anymore because this is real and this is alive. And this is more alive than anything that the damage to my body might cost me. The way we live becomes evident because we will live even at the expense of our own comfort and our own safety. And even at the expense of those who would look at us and say we have no common sense. The sense that I have in Christ is not common. What I have received from Christ is not common. What the Lord offers us this morning is not common, if you'll stand with me. What the Lord seeks to pour out on his people, what the Lord wants to do for you and in your life is not common. And so if it seems nonsense, so be it for the sake of the cross. So be it for the sake of eternity. So be it for the sake of having Christ alive in me and in you. Do not do yourself the disservice this morning of embracing a cultural Christianity. Do not do others the disservice of modeling a faith that does not include Christ. Do not short sell the decision you ask people to make by oversimplifying it. Be direct and be honest, beginning with yourself. Have I received the gospel that Jesus preached? The change in your own life and in your family and in your community will come at great cost, and that's embodied in the life of Christ himself. The last scripture I'm going to give you this morning as we close is this, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Paul says, examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Do you recognize yourselves? Do you not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you? Then you failed the test. This morning I ask you this question as I come to the close of what I know is a difficult message. But I don't apologize for it. I ask you this question. When you examine your own life, what faith do you actually have? When you examine your own life, is Christ alive in me? Or am I living a culture? Am I living a standard that just got me in the club? When I look in the mirror, do I recognize myself or do I see my Savior? What faith do you have this morning? When you look at yourself, do you see Him or do you fail the test? I pray this morning that if we call ourselves disciples, we do not fail the test. And that if we do, we would come quickly to true repentance and belief in Christ. And we would stop trying to live a life as a Christian without Christ in us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Father, I thank you today for this message and the opportunity to gather with your people. I thank you for the conviction of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for the honesty and the directness of your word. I thank you for the example of your son being honest and direct with those who would follow him. There will be a distinction about you. People will respond to it. There will be a cost, but it is not greater than the reward. I thank you for presenting us with the same picture this morning and the opportunity to evaluate ourselves, as Paul said. Father, send your spirit to do its work in us, to do his work in us. Father, remove from us anything that is not pleasing to you, that is not giving you glory, that has just become a cultural lifestyle. And Father, replace it with your spirit. Let us not fail the test. Let us truly be Christians in whom you live and breathe. Let us be a people that bring you glory. In your name we pray. Amen. God, oh, thank you for being here this morning. If you'd like to pray, I will be here once we turn off the camera. Otherwise, you are dismissed. Hope you have a great day, and I will look forward to seeing you again very soon.